Hello YouTubers, fellow hams, RVers. Well, this is my first video from the desert. I'm parked out here on a mesa, north of Yuma, hanging out with some other hams. They call themselves the Rat Pack. Friendly bunch. I might uh, elaborate a bit more in a future video if they're interested in being on camera. Uh, I th was thinking on the drive out here that I, maybe I would do a video on uh, solar systems, charge controllers, and pulse width modulation, PWM, which many charge controllers use, uh, but I don't think I've, well, I haven't seen a really good explanation of, so I thought I'd just go ahead and do one. So for you new guys that are interested in solar, uh, we're going to try to cover how these things work. Now I apologize for the low quality video. It's quite chilly here on the Mesa this morning. As you can tell, I'm wearing a hood inside. It's uh, yeah, 49 degrees in here, it's warming up. Um, anyway, uh, let's get right down to it. So, a typical solar setup. You're going to have um, your solar panels, you know, and they're gonna, they're gonna feed through a charge controller. In my case, I've got this Wanderer that came with the uh, Renogy solar kit that I bought, the 200 watt kit. And then, of course, your storage system, your batteries. Now, in, uh, in my examples, um, I'm kind of generalizing the typical basic uh, setup. There are all kinds of different configurations with different types of batteries, um, lead acid, AGM, uh, lithium uh, in the newer set systems. You know, so there's a lot of variables here. I'm just going to generalize a sort of typical common uh, configuration. So this would be your, just your generic, typical solar setup. Your source, your solar panels out here, your controller that controls the charging of your battery so you don't overcharge it and damage it, and then of course your storage system. Now a uh, typical charge cycle, uh, what, the con what the controller is going to do um, is, let's say you start down here where your battery is depleted because you've been using it overnight and we need to charge it up. The sun's come up, we've got power coming in on the solar panels. So what the charge controller is going to do is it's going to push the batteries on up to a peak voltage and usually that is above the normal charged voltage. In a lead acid battery, uh, nominally they're fully charged when they're at 13.7 volts or thereabouts, 13.6, 13.7. Uh, my charge controller will push the battery initially up to 14.2 um, and that initial bit of overcharge kind of equalizes the cells in the battery. A battery consists of multiple cells and they can be at varying states of charge and by pushing it a little higher than normal um, you charge up the uh, some of the cells and some might not be fully charged you'll push them up as well so that all the cells will be charged. And then the, the uh, charge controller, after it's reached that peak point, is going to switch into float mode. And the uh, battery voltage is going to fall off a bit until it reaches the float voltage, which is nominally or typically, in lead acid technology anyway, 13.7 volts. And then the charge controller is going to remain in a float mode. Now that's the first thing I wanted to clarify for you. Um, what is a float charge? Well, in a float charge, the charge controller is going to watch the battery voltage. It's targeting a, a set voltage, and in my case 13.7 volts. And if you increase the load that you're drawing on the system and, and pull the battery down below that, that float voltage, the charge controller is going to increase the amount of power that it's passing from the solar panels to bring it back up to 13.7. If it rises above that, the charge controller is going to decrease the amount of power that it's passing through to target that voltage. And that ability of the charge controller to vary the amount of power that's coming through is where we get into pulse width modulation. So as an analogy, let's think of plumbing. So we've got our, our a full bucket of water here, our water source, right? And then we've got a valve. And then we've got our load, in this case an empty bucket. If we open that valve all the way up, water is going to flow as fast as it can through the pipe 
into our load or into the other bucket. That's kind of what's going on with the initial charge. The charge controller is opening that valve all the way and letting every bit of power that the panels can produce flow through to your battery to fill it up. When it reaches float mode, it's kind of closing that valve down, not all the way, just partially to limit the amount of power that's coming through. Uh, an electrical equivalent of that would be something like this. You can think of a transistor, which is this is a schematic symbol for a transistor here, as that valve, okay? And the charge controller is going to be monitoring the, the uh, voltage from the battery here and then turning that valve on and off as needed to control the, the amount of power that's passing through to the battery. Um, this would be a linear uh, controller. Uh, meaning that this transistor is turned on partially at times just to limit the amount of power that's coming through and not on all the way. Um, the downside to this approach is heat. Okay, if we think about our uh, water bucket analogy, if this valve is partially opened, okay, it's resisting the full flow of water from our bucket, resisting it. Um, limiting how much is going through. Well, in electronics, um, if we are only turning this transistor on partially and it's resisting the flow of current through from the panels to our battery, well, resisting that flow of current is going to generate heat. And that heat has to be removed by a big heat sink, but also that heat is power loss, you know, because some of the energy coming from our panel is turning into heat and it's just radiating away off that transistor. So it's not very efficient. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna waste some power there. Also, it's a little bit tricky in the control circuitry, um, finding the amount of turn on for that transistor to get just the right amount of current to flow. Usually the charge controller will have a current measurement in, in here um, so it can measure the amount of current going to the battery and make its adjustments. You know, so linear, that's the way linear works. And that brings us to pulse width modulation. So back to the plumbing analogy. Imagine that this valve only had two states, all the way open and all the way closed, nothing in between. All you could do was go full on or full off, full on, full off. How would you regulate how much water is flowing through the system? Well, the answer to that is you turn the valve on and off on and off, on and off, continuously. And how long you leave it on determines how much water flows through. So if you leave it on half the time, you turn it on for half a second, off for half a second, on for half a second, off for half a second, you're automatically limiting the flow to 50%. That's what pulse width modulation does. Here is an example of pulse width modulation. Now, each of these rectangles represents a pulse, a turning on state and then a turning off state, right? So like here at the 40% range, we're turning it on for 40% of the time, turning it off for 60% of the time. Turning it on for 40% of the time, turning it off for 60% of the time. Over and over and over again means we're only gonna pass 40% of the available power. Uh, here's 20% modulation up here, and you can see the pulse is even shorter. We're only turning the valve on for 20% of the time and turning it off for 80% of the time. On for 20% of the time, off for 80% of the time. And this happens very, very fast. Um, thousands of times a second these pulses occur. And the percentage of time that the pulse is on versus off completely relates to the amount of power you're passing. If it's on for 50% of the time, you're passing 50% of the power. It's a very precise way of controlling power flow. That's what pulse width modulation is. The uh, downside to pulse width modulation is these square waves, uh, they generate a lot of noise, RF noise or electrical noise. For most appliances, TVs and things like that, you're not gonna notice it. For ham radio guys like me, and some of you, um, that's going to generate some, some noise on the radio bands. So that's the downside to a pulse width modulated uh, solar charge controller. Um, 
some of them have really good filtering and they'll remove a lot of that noise. Some of them won't. Uh, my Wanderer that I have, which is a cheap one, it came with the kit, it does generate RF noise and I can hear it on some of the bands as little birdies that I have to notch out. Um, I'll show you a demonstration of that here. Okay, I am tuned on the 40 meter amateur band and this is the center frequency, this line here. And right there, you can see a solid signal right there. If I tune over to it, we'll hear it. Now you can hear that tone. That's this signal right here, and that is a birdie. That's coming from my solar. Now I'm going to switch off the solar, and when I do, you'll see the birdie disappear. And there you go. I turned off the solar and no more birdie. So that's an example of what the pulse width modulation is creating as far as uh, signals on the radio spectrum. Now what about pulse width modulation? Can we see it in action? Yes we can. I'm going to hook the oscilloscope up to my battery here and I'll show you um, the pulse width modulation actually changing as I change the load on the battery. You'll have to pardon the uh, noise. I have to run the generator to run the scope. Now what I've got is I've got my oscilloscope hooked up to the battery rail. And I'm on the 100 millivolt scale. And we can actually see, uh, aside from all the noise, you can see the square wave pulse here. Um, I've put this one right at the beginning of the center graticule line here. So you can see it's going about halfway across to this line. But here's the interval from here to here is the interval and you can see it's only about 20 to 30 uh, percent pulse width right now and the battery is pretty much fully charged now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a load on the system by turning on my inverter and what we should see is we should see the solar controller increase that pulse width there to pass more power to compensate for the load so here I'm going to turn on the inverter Yeah, there you go. You can see how the added load, the uh, pulse width went from here out almost to this line now. So it's it's up to maybe 35 or 40 percent pulse width to compensate for the additional load that I've just put on it. Now I'm going to turn my radio on and add some more load to it. Let's see what else can I turn on. Turn a few more things on here. Oh, now the trigger's getting unhappy. Well, now I can't get the trigger to lock on again. Kinda, sorta. It's getting just too noisy. I got too many things running here. Alright, come on, trigger. Lock. The scope is confused because there's too many things to try and trigger on. But you could see how the pulse got wider. All right, I'm going to turn the radio off. And I'm going to turn the inverter off. And now what we should see is uh, as the battery recovers, you'll start to see that pulse width narrow. Oh, after a moment, you can see the pulse width has started to narrow down now. It's it's recharging the battery, recovering the energy I pulled out from running the equipment. And you can see there's a little bit of a gap here. It's beginning to narrow. It's slowly getting narrower and narrower. So as the battery is recharging, the pulse width modulation is narrowing out to pass less power from the solar panels. So there you go. You could actually see pulse width modulation in action. Isn't that cool? Uh, so what what's the... Uh, What's the advantages to that technology? Well, certainly you've got far more precise control over power flow. If you want to flow exactly 60% of the power, you simply leave the pulses on for 60% of the time. You know, it's, it's very precise. That, that makes it easier for computer-controlled circuitry to modulate power flow. Um, also, uh, it's more efficient, much more efficient. 
since those transistors, or in most of them field effect transistors, are being turned all the way on or all the way off, they, they aren't in a state in the middle where they have to resist the flow of power to a degree. So they don't run as hot. Um, you don't lose as much energy in the form of heat through the, uh, through the device. So um, it's efficiency. It's a, it's a big improvement in efficiency. That's why uh, manufacturers go to this method for controlling the amount of power going through. So hopefully that demystified uh, pulse width modulation for you. If you have any further questions, of course, you can leave them in the comments. I do read all the comments, and I'll respond if, uh, if you have a question. Um, hope you found that uh, informative. Have a good day. It's starting to warm up here. I'm going to hopefully get this video uploaded and maybe take some pictures of the desert uh, for the social media page. It's really pretty out here. So until the next one. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.